Hello, I'm Steph from iDriver Classic and in today's video we're experiencing two things that I wasn't expecting to experience today. Number one, blazing hot sunshine in England and number two, this beautiful Leyland P76. Now if you know anything about these cars, you'll know that they were never made or sold in England. So this one's been exported in from the other side of the world and I'm really excited to take you out in it and drive with you today because this has been on my dream drive list since, my goodness, I can't remember when and I thought I was going to have to wait until I went to Australia next to try one and to try one today I am absolutely just this is my best day out ever and I'm really excited to share it with you so in the video we're going to have a look around the outside of the car under the bonnet I'm going to show you inside let you hear that V8 burbling away and I'm also going to take you out on a test drive now you probably guessed that this doesn't look as it did when it left the factory but you've still got that Leyland P76 driving experience so come on buckle up let's go and experience this beautiful car by the time the P76 arrived on the forecourt, the Australian market had been sold plenty of British vehicles and the links between British Leyland and Leyland Australia and Australia itself was well established. For more information on how this market developed, it's worth looking at the export or die policy which kicked in after the Second World War. Essentially, manufacturers of vehicles had to sell a proportion of their vehicles abroad and that was to access the government steel supplies and of course, bring much needed money into the country. Now, there is a Morris video knocking around YouTube and it shows because it's from the immediate post-war period, 95% of Morris products being exported, which in short means that more than a handful of Australians were thoroughly well acquainted with British marks. Now back to the P76. This is a really interesting creation by British Leyland, or should I say Leyland Australia, because many of the vehicles that had arrived from British Leyland themselves and BMC before that in the 40s, 50s and 60s were designed for the British market. And with that, they were thoroughly unsuitable for the Australian market because drivers in Australia are doing hundreds of miles, crossing rocky terrains, battling much hotter climates. It's a very different market indeed. So the journey to the creation of this car was a logical one. Leyland knew that to compete in the Australian market with marks such as Ford and Chrysler, they needed to make a car which was designed with the terrain, the climate, the competition, and of course, the customer expectation in mind. Now this is at Leyland's first foray into making an Australian offering, and the Kimberley had come before it. But the P76 was the car that Leyland Australia saw as the car which would redefine their position within the market. Now, first of all, the company did away with all the wheezy engines which had powered their British cousins. And the company went in with two engine options. And they do this to rival homegrown and Australian competitors. Cars like the Ford Falcon, the Holden Kingswood, the Chrysler Valiant. And they then issued the P76 with either a V8 or a 6. Now, recognising what Australians were used to, the company designed the vehicle with a 111 inch wheelbase, which was very standard for what Australians liked at the time. And they paired the meaty engine choices with either an automatic or a manual. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we look around the car. You also got rack and pinion steering. And for the suspension, the company went with McPherson struts with coil springs, dampers, and anti roll bar to front, and four link with coil springs and dampers to rear. The car also had 35 cubic feet of boot space which when we practically tested it and had a bit of a laugh on the day it was big enough to hide me and the week shopping in the boot with room to spare for the toolkit. Now all of this is going so well so far. Leyland spent 20 million Australian dollars on the creation of the car and it was rigorously tested. Leyland stated within their sales brochures which accompanied the P76 that the car had been tested in three separate operations over four years doing the equivalent of 100,000 miles of testing. And they'd even tested it in the Australian outback in the searing heat. Because of course you want to know if it overheats. And here's the thing, when they took the prototype, the car stood up to every challenge. And so that convinces Leyland it's wise to take the car to market. And in fact, the car even won Wheels Car of the Year 1973. But then something terrible happens because everything that can go wrong 
goes wrong. Now I'm going to talk about this when we go driving, but essentially there's a pick and mix of terrible things. The early cars are poorly built, there's an oil crisis, and there's even rumoured sabotage from market rivals, although we can't prove that with any written literature, so we have to say it's a rumour. And there are lots of other silly little errors which could have been avoided. And all that culminates in the car being described on marketing booklets as anything but average, becoming anything but reliable. Now Leyland did try and combat this and if you look at a later sales brochure you'll see them talking about the buyer protection plan which covers the car for the first 12,000 miles but by this point the damage is done, the buyers are scared off and no one's that keen to buy into it and in the end quite frustratingly all the hard work didn't pay off and that beautiful feisty P76 just doesn't cut into the market like it deserves to. And in the end, they only sold around 18,000 units. Now today, the car, probably a little bit like our homegrown Austin Allegro, is a beloved underdog of classic fanatics in both Australia and New Zealand. But it has far fewer fans than it should do than if everything had gone to plan and hadn't been overly rushed. Now realise the inside has been slightly modified with a slightly tweaked dash, but let me show you it and introduce this car in a little bit more detail. Coming inside here, you'll see that because someone spent some money, Leyland's little strap line of anything but average starts to come into play a little bit more because it does look incredibly mean in here, which really matches the outside because sometimes cars can look really foreboding from the outside and you get in and you think, I'm kind of underwhelmed. But inside here, even though it's a 70s car and quite a lot of 70s cars can look a wee bit dated. This doesn't look like that. And I think some of that is down to, originally it would have had a wood fascia, and I think it's all wood finish fascia in these sorts of areas. And I think sometimes stuff like that can really show a car's age. Whereas because it's all been redone in black, it just looks, I don't know, a wee bit more modern. It looks more like late 70s, early 80s-ish instead. So first of all, look at the size of this glove box. And this glove box is longer than my forearm. It is enormous. But when you get it open, you actually realize that the space just funnels back and it's probably not much bigger than the glove box in my marina. It's actually quite small. Now you've got those four cup holders in the top there. I don't know if that's original because I've not been able to find a brochure picture with that open, but cup holders are always a good one, right? Now coming into the centre here, you've got a modern CD stereo into the centre, but again, because it's black and it doesn't feel over the top, it doesn't look too out of place. Coming down from there, you've got your cigar lighter and you've got your ashtray. Now I will say, even though they have retrimmed some of this, this is obviously the original plastic because not that it feels tinny, but it feels slightly brittle and I felt I feel nervous every time I open it, I keep thinking, don't break it. Coming down from there, you've got your air vents. And now these are really good because when I put the air con on earlier, and yes, we have got air con, these were blasting at me and I thought, whew, because it's mid twenties today, which for anyone in England will know that's quite warm for us. Anyone watching in Australia where these were made, they're gonna be like, Steph, that is not warm at all, but for us it is. Now coming down from here, you've got your automatic box. Now these are, I think you've got the choice of three speed auto, which is what we've got in this, or the three or four speed manual boxes. So there you go, that's what we've got. We've got a sumptuous armrest, which again is another cubby hole that we can put stuff into. And then we come in front of us. Now, if you went for the bottom of the range, so it went deluxe, super, and then executive, and this is executive, you only got a couple of bits and pieces here. You've got more blanking plates. Now this has been tweaked around with because it's got a rev counter in. Don't think it would have had a rev counter originally, but you've got your amp meter, you've got your rev counter, you've got a temperature gauge, you've got your speedo. Now this runs up to 200 kilometers per hour. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of a confession. Earlier, I thought I was doing 40 miles per hour. And then I thought, blimey, this feels really slow. And that's when I realized that we were in kilometers. Coming over from there, you've got your fuel gauge, and then you've got a few little dials here. So you've got your heater controls there. 
you've got your windscreen wipers or your controls there you've got your air con and my goodness it's certainly needed today as i've already mentioned and you've got your light switch and you've got trip clock adjuster there and that is pretty much everything it's all very very simple which is the kind of driving that i like because you get to enjoy it and with that v8 we know that we're going to have a good time today and it really wafts along can't wait to show you it but first of all you probably need to hear it in action so remember as i was telling you earlier you could have got the v8 or the v6 Let's get this to start. We have to push the key slightly in. It's a bit of a trick to it. So if I don't get it right first time, please forgive me. It sounds really tame, but have a listen. It sounds just so mean. It sounds even better from the outside with those twin exhausts. Come on, I'll show you. Right, let's go on an adventure. I'm only slightly nervous, so that's fine. It's funny because you park this next to a modern vehicle and it doesn't look that big at all. You know, like all these ginormous SUVs that are everywhere. But for someone who drives a very small classic car daily, it's quite a strange experience. Oh God, listen to her go. Well, listen to her go over the speed bumps. I was talking about that suspension to you earlier. It's actually quite good. Now, one thing I will say is, is these seats are very sumptuous. Because remember, this was made for the Australian market. They're doing very different mileage to the kind of mileage that we do. For us, a long journey might be 50 miles. For them, like my auntie in Australia, she thinks nothing of doing 250 miles to Perth. She'll do that and back in a day, and I think, I couldn't do it, I'd be knackered. But they're all so used to it over there, which kind of explains why the interior is maybe a little bit better. Now I know that a lot of you are going to be out there watching and you're going to say to me, Steph, the P76 is a lemon. It was known for it. It was, that's what everybody knew it for. They knew it was rubbish. But here's the thing. There's a word that I'm going to chuck into this conversation now and that's bias. And there are two types of bias at play here. Number one is, is I think this is great because I'm taking out a Survivor, a car that's had loads of money spent on it a car that is a, a really good example of it. So for me, I've got survivor bias. For people that remember these when they were new and remember the first year of production, they've got that bias of only remembering the bad examples, which is, I guess, a really good example of why first impressions really do count. Now, I'm not too frightened to put my foot down because I was talking about those brakes earlier. Did you see, by the way, I'm gonna show you, the brakes are even marked up that they're special. Leyland really went to town on this. Now, it's handling, look, she come around these corners. And people had told me that the handling was rubbish, but I don't think it is. I actually think it's really good. As I come around these windy English roads, which I was a little bit nervous about as well, because the vehicle's much, much bigger than what I'm used to. Now, the one thing I will say is, is that I was also quite worried about visibility but I've managed to adjust the mirror up. I can see just about to the end corners of the bonnet. I could do the seat maybe being an inch or two higher, but at first I was quite worried when I was out and I thought, oh, I'm not gonna get my head into it. But it is, look, just drives beautifully. And it feels such a meaty, just a, such a meaty masculine car that you can really get your teeth stuck into. And it's just, Oh, it's lovely. Now I know that I am biased because I am testing a really great example, but I will say one thing is Craig has had this a little while and thank you very much, Craig, for trusting me with your pride and joy today. And I said to him, I said, where do you get parts for this? Because they were never made here. And he said, oh, he said, it's been so good. I've actually not really needed anything. But I said, what would you do if you needed parts? And he said that there are owners clubs in Australia and he highlighted, there's one in Tasmania, one in Western Australia, and 
there's another one. Oh, was it Queensland, I believe? And there's another club in New Zealand. And he said that they are enormously supportive because whilst he's not needed um, parts per se, he's had questions about certain things. And he said that they've all been so warm and welcoming and generous with both their expertise and their time that it's really made it quite a pleasurable experience to own the car. And we talk a lot about owners clubs when we do cars and we talk about the power of owners clubs and how they can make or break an experience at times. And he's just said how lovely they are. And he did highlight somebody whose name has probably left my brain. I'm going to put it on a little note at the bottom there for you now. And he said that he's just been a real pleasure, this chap from the Western Australia branch. And he's been really helpful. And he knew this car when it was in Australia. And um, was able to give him some really good insight and back history on it as well, which I think is always a lovely thing to have. Now I'm going to try and find another decent road. It is somewhat difficult because this is a car that was really built for Australia. Unlike some of the other stuff that you see that goes out to Australia and you think, oh my goodness. Like there's a lot of cars that BMC, Leyland built, they weren't for an Australian market. When they built this, it was for the Australian market. Do you remember we took out that Austin 1800 Ute that had been turned into a little panel van? And that was, you know, designed for Australia, but it wasn't really. This was. And remember, they were up against it when they did this. Now, that's no excuse for early build quality being a bit naff, but they did it on a budget of 20, I think it was 20 million Australian dollars, um, which maybe does explain somewhat why certain corners are cut. And they're coming up against people like Ford, Chrysler, that have massive budgets and a car that's maybe suitable for America is suitable for Australia. So it makes things a lot easier for them. Whereas Leyland, we're not designing cars for that market where people have giant open roads and hundreds of miles to travel. So they didn't have that expertise. And I think a lot of that, along with the fuel crisis, really did just put them on a back foot straight away. But when you look at the car with today's eyes on it, and you know we talk about that survivor bias because the cars that exist today are going to be much better because they've been built up of parts they've you know they've all been snag tested they've had everything done to them that they need to have done so when you take them out they are much better than the early examples of 1973 and so you get that great impression that Leyland wanted you to have and I'm having it today and if I was living in Australia and I wanted a classic I don't know that I would go for a Morris Minor like I have here I'd probably go for something like this because as you cruise along you can see here look the handling of the steering is just really nice it's really gentle it doesn't feel too light so you feel like you're not really in control of the car but it feels responsive enough that even though it's a whacking great beast, you can bring it round these corners with relative ease. The brakes are more than adequate. That is such a complaint of many Leyland vehicles of the 70s, is they build a car, but the brakes don't really match up to it. Um, the styling, I think, looks mean, enticing, it's eye-catching. Every time we've driven past somebody today, they've stopped and turned round and double taken the car and be like, wow, and it's got that wow factor that maybe it didn't have back then because people looked at it and thought, oh, it's a bit ugly or whatever. But nowadays it really holds its own, like many of the Michelotti designs that still do. Although I tell you what, I would never have pegged this down as a Michelotti design. I think it is, it shows his diversity as a designer and a visionary that he could create something like this and something like the Meadows Frisky. It really shows his range and I love that. But yeah, I mean, take it away from it. What, what would I change or what don't I like about this? Well, number one is I do like a manual gear change. I'm never really a big fan of an automatic. So I would really like to have a manual box in this. Um, I'd like the seat to maybe be an inch higher because I am quite short. But I'm sure if I sat on a cushion, I could probably see right to the end of the bonnet. At the moment, I can just glimpse the bottom corners. Visibility is great. These little mirrors 
are well positioned and there again I'd probably bring that one up another inch or two higher the rear view mirror shows me everything I need to see and as we cruise along on these pothole roads it handles it all with its stride it's an attractive pleasing vehicle that could do everything you need it to do it looks sensational I think personally I mean that's personal taste and it's a real joy to see it here in England it's, I don't think it's a vehicle that would have sold in England I think it's far too big and a little bit brash for English taste at the time but for me now in today's world of classics where we get to look back and take our pick from the best examples that have survived I think it's a great little thing indeed now first I think we're going to wrap it up there thank you so much to Craig for lending us your pride and joy it's been really wonderful to take out and experience a car which I wouldn't get to experience unless I was on the other side of the world um, well done to all the previous owners of this that have really spent some money on it you can see how much love time and care and attention has gone into it and thank you very much to all the clubs for sharing your support and wisdom because without you there wouldn't be these cars still on the road today but that's it from me today let me know what you think in the comment section below whether you think it does look above average in today's world or whether you're like no it's a lemon and i'm over it but until next sunday when we're looking at something very different once again take care and drive safely